Hi, and welcome to GM Tips after a long weekend. This is GM Rick here. I hope everybody's doing good. Um, topics today, fun topic today. Uh, going into hopefully a one shot, uh, and I, it's not really a one shot, a module with some friends on here. I'm looking forward to it with the pirate side of things. So I'm going to flavor things today on water campaigns for fantasy games like D&D and for uh, Pathfinder 3 or Pathfinder and D&D 3.5. So, what do you need to know for a waterborne campaign? That one's a little bit more interesting. First of all, you got to get used to nautical terms and ships of probably ancient Greece up to 1800s style um, Victorian England. Really about price 15s and 1600s would be the best time frame. Because a lot of the advances that were in the 1800s are not going to be on a uh, fantasy based game ship. So keep that in mind. There's a lot of different types of ships. And one of the things I wanted to talk with you on those is the uh, types of ships there are. So we're going to take a look at some of the ships here that there are of the different types and I'm going to use my iPad along with this because I think this will be in, invaluable for you when it comes to looking up ships. There are a lot of different types. Uh, a lot of people think, well, they're all the same. Yeah, they are somewhat the same, but every country didn't do ships the same. So let's see, ancient uh, ship types. And, and that's what I do my search on. When you do a search, do an ancient ship types. And those are going to be, and what you want to do is you want to pull up on images. So as you can see, I pull up on ancient ship types here. And there's some of them. And, and let me go back one. Um, I did the search. We're working with ancient ship types. Okay, so what are there? And there are different ones. Like for instance, these are the merchant class ships of the 17 and 1800s. Sometimes they're not ancient enough. And and again, I'm going to try to zoom in some. Unfortunately, my camera doesn't do the best when I'm zooming in. But it will list under the the different merchant sailing ship types. What types are there now? I love this one for the outlines. I think this really and truly hits the different types of ships. So what kind of ships do you have on this? It starts out and you have a three master which is the fully rigged ship or the ship of the line as they call them a lot of times. You also have three masted barks. What was the difference in them? Not a whole lot other than how the rigging and the sails were done with the masts. That's the biggest thing between the fully rigged ship and the bark. And then you also had the bark and teen. And again, the difference is you look, the bark's in the middle at the top. The bark and teen is at the full right of this screen. You can see the sails. They are just different types of sails they used. So a lot of this is the, the physical form of the cut ship is the same. And as you go through, what, what were the most famous types of ships that were used? For pirate killers, the barks and the barkentines. Large pirate ships, so, so, so say somebody captured a large ship of the line, the barks were usually the largest. Pirates, you got to remember, didn't want a heavy ship. They did not, because they didn't want to slug it out with the Royal Navy. They just did not. So in your campaigns, keep that in mind. Your pirates are not going to want to duke it out with the ship of the line. They're just not. They want to swoop in and get that merchant ship, empty the merchant ship, take the merchant ship, force press gang the crew, take them with them and convert the ship so that, because each ship had a certain look to it. So what they would do is go take it to a squib, and the squib, and it's, it's an interesting term, but the squib shops would take and change the profile of the ship. And that's something that's really key when you're playing the campaigns. If, if the players go and capture themselves a ship and don't change it, they're going to be immediately identified as the ones that took the ship from some empire, and it's not going to go well. They also used schooners. Schooners were a faster ship. Um, usually a two-master or a three-master was about as big as most pirate ships were. Um, they would use, um, some of them would use cutters 
and caravels and sloops. Sloops were probably the most common type. Once in a while they would get themselves a frigate. And again, what's the difference? Size of the ship and mast and how many decks it had. And, and pirates normally took and had modified hidey holes in their ships. So, say your players want to start out, they want to get in a waterborne campaign, and they want a pirate flavor, and they take their first ship. They're going to have to take it to a squib shop and re retrofit it. And so keep that in mind as a GM. You want to set up a whole place and a whole network for them where they can go and do these things. Players, as you're playing this, keep in mind, you have to think like the pirates did. Number one, they wanted to plunder. Number two, they wanted to sate their bloodthirst in some cases against certain empires or places where they were from. Number three, they were a pillaging little lot. And, and not all of them were. There were corsairs, which were a little different than your normal pirate, and, and, and your um, buccaneers, which are a little different than your normal pirate, and then there, there were your cutthroat pirates. So you had different types that played. Now in the inner sea, if you're playing Pathfinder, the, the free captaincy of the inner sea is a real tightly knit lot. In other words, the pirates forged their own empire, and they have a storm king that sits atop of them. And that storm king rules. That's true of most empires, even in Faerun and other places. They had a council of captains. Why was that? So they didn't kill each other. Pirates wanted to plunder, but they would they would take each other down. Well, that's self-defeating in some ways. And number two, they had to come together in times of distress when like a whole royal navy was coming after them. So keep that in mind as you do these things. It's not always just this easy little plight that, hey, you know, we're just going to go be pirates. No, there was a lot more involved to it. And uh, they had to find a place in a locale where they could hide a ship. You don't want your ship spotted with its mast sitting by an island. So there had to be some sort of a cove that they'd bring it into. And a lot of times those coves would have coral reefs and other natural barriers that kept navies out and would allow those ships to, to skulk into there and then no one else to follow them. And a lot of times around the islands, they would pick islands with barrier reefs as well as coral reefs that provided a natural barrier so a whole navy couldn't come in with the ships of the line. They would sit, they would sit too low. Or a pirate ship unloaded sits higher. And even loaded, it only sat so low. A ship with cannons on it or with a full complement of marines sits pretty low in the waters. And so the pirates would try to judge these things. They weren't, again, pirates weren't the most intelligent lot, but they were wise and crafty and wily when it came to what they did. And they tried to understand their area and their, their terrain of what their home base was because they wanted to utilize it in such a way that they could keep other pirates and keep also the Navy out. So again, ships, and I led kind of into the second things, the order of understanding a pirate or a, a marine navy. Now, if you're not playing a pirate, so say you're playing the pirate chasers, what would you want to know? You want to know where your pirates go the most. They usually pick the most popular avenues of, of shipping lanes that, that the ships like to use because it was easy fruit. It was low-hanging fruit. Now, sometimes you would be that man of war guarding them. And so the thing you have to keep in mind, a pirate sloop or a pirate cutter or a pirate caravel or a pirate frigate would always be faster than you. They want to be able to carry minimal guns, enough to harass and harry you and keep that, you away from them. But at the same time, they want to outrun you. So they're not going to carry tons of cannonballs and powder. They just didn't do that. There's no way the ship would be caught. And so they wanted to be crafty. They had enough. They had some little, you know, eight-pounder guns. They had some lighter guns. And they would use them. They had a the little duck cannon. And that was used against Marines who were trying to board them. They weren't trying to do it to sink a ship. But, boy, that ball sure would harass a bunch of Marines trying to throw over the grapnels to pull the ships together. And that's the other thing. You know, as a sailor, you got to remember that. You're trying to pull that pirate ship to you to board it. So you're going to need boarding axes, you're going to be boarding grapples, you're going to either need um, uh, some sort of um, ballista or cannon, depending on whether you use black powder or not, to harass the pirates who are going to be swinging over to try to keep you from boarding them. So this becomes a big clash as the two come together with the ropes. 
And the pirates are trying to cut your ropes. You're trying to secure more ropes because you don't want them getting away. And you want to take into that ship and just destroy those pirates. Now, remember, a lot of times you would carry a complement of anywhere from 80 to 150 marines on your ship. So as players, when you outfit your ship to go after the pirates, you want enough marine complement on there to keep things uh, in your favor. You want to outnumber the pirates. And the Marines were hardy fighters that knew how to fight on the deck and in the water and do that. So keep that in mind. Now, if you're a merchant, you want to have Marines or other ships guarding you. So if you're trying to get stuff from point A to point B as a merchant crew, that's the kind of things you got to keep in mind. You want protection. Why? Because you don't want the pirates swooping in and finding you as easy prey. Now, some merchant ships stock themselves quite well with defensive type of weaponry to repel grapnels and boarding, uh, boarding hooks and, and boarding axes. They would do whatever they could to try to keep you off of them. So, or try to keep the pirates, I'm sorry, not you, but the pirates off of you. So you've got to look at these type of things. There, there's just a whole different mindset of thinking. A lot of GMs going in, we don't think that. I didn't. My first pirate campaign that I ran at Skulls and Shackles, I didn't realize until I read the, the guide, and I recommend that. If, if you haven't done it, go to paizo.com's website. Go to the Skull and Shackles Adventure Path and download the free uh, player's guide. The player's guide has a wealth of not only nautical terms, ship types, information you need to know. And it's stuff you can convert to AD&D, or, or excuse me, to D&D 3.5. I still think of it as AD&D. Um, D&D 3.5 or over to 5e. Or even 4e if you want. Any of those have conversion paths. So just keep that in mind. It's a wealth of information that they compiled in one area that I really think was a good job. It's not awesome, but they did a really good job. And it helped me to understand how do you make ships come in at each other? How do you ram each other? What do you do? What kind of hit points are there? What kind of attacks are there? How do you how do you go from long range ship attack battles to close range boarding battles? And it had all that information in there and things that were just invaluable. Plus the type of weapons that pirates would use and that sailors would use as well. So all those things were in, in play. Plus, it also gave you weather conditions, spells that would affect your ship speed. So if you're a spellcaster trying to affect your ship, what do you need? What kind of things are important in that in that vein? And so please get that. If you haven't gotten that as a player, add it to your collection. It's free, number one. And number two, it's invaluable information that it would take you hours upon hours to compile and convert. So just don't do that to yourself. Utilize the resources at hand. Um, there's a lot of other pirate guides. And so I think for me, knowing those kind of things were important for players and GMs, and especially in the campaign you want to play. For the GM, creating water tables you need tables for islands and island encounters. You need them for the water, open water. And the thing that gets forgotten in the water campaigns is ships. There are gore, there are leviathans, there are uh, sirens, there are everything else, merfolk, shahagan, um, scum. You get a, you put all those things on your tables, and yet you forget pirate ships, warships, and merchant ships and sometimes just freebooters, so the smugglers. Those all should be a part of the encounters on the water because you can run into them. That's what you ran into back in the day. And so keep that in mind, as well as storms. Storms were common out on the ocean. Depending on what type of ocean you're in and where you are on the equator, storms can be quite common and quite deadly, especially if you, if you don't know how to sail into them. So create those type of things and have those, as well as encounters for the islands. You're not going to find every creature under the sun on the islands. You're going to find a certain type. I love that Paizo put dinosaurs on the islands. I think that's kind of really cool. So you can run into some dinosaurs out there. You could be a dinosaur hunter even as part of your waterborne campaign. So keep that in mind. Um, slavery. <laughs> it's a not like topic to be talked in in games, but that was common. 
pirates would slave and press gang people that you it is kind of an indentured service but you earned your rank among the pirates they also sold people for ransoms and they also sold people for value so keep that in mind these were not the nicest people in the world some of them had more honor than others some of them hated uh, slavery because they came out of it others didn't Others used it and trafficked humans just as much as the next man. So you as a GM and a player group have to sit down and see what you're comfortable with. I don't think running a campaign that, I mean, it can exist, but you don't have to flaunt it in somebody's face, especially if they're uncomfortable about it. Uh, so just keep that in mind, but that was part of things. Also, for pirate campaigns, what classes make really good classes? And I'm going to hit classes in both books. So, for D&D &D 5e and 3e 5, the great pirates were rogues, bards, warlocks, um, sorcerers, druids. Why? You control nature and weather. A druid doesn't have to be good. Okay, they can be quite nasty. Um, clerics of a certain water deity or water god or goddess. In, in some campaigns, you have a pirate goddess or a sea goddess or or something along that, or god. So keep that in mind. Um, fighters, of course, always. Um, for both campaigns, both Pathfinder and D&D, gunslingers, especially if you are using black powder. Swashbucklers. I know they're available in D&D 5e in the homebrew content. So keep that in mind. Um, barbarians. Absolutely. Barbarians are the more vicious, brutal pirates of the seas. And they can be the really nasty nasties as they're raging out there on the sea. I wouldn't do monk cavaliers. Monks are too lawful in my mind to, to really go after that. Now you can do them for merchants or for the navy absolutely uh, but for pirates yeah it's kind of dicey unless you're lawful evil that's possible but really not the most probable thing lawful neutral wouldn't they're a letter of the law so you're going to be breaking the law they're not going to want to do that um witches absolutely Witches can be some of the most devastating captains on the sea or first mates or even your spellcaster on board your ship. So that's kind of an interesting lot to work with. Um, those are the main ones for D&D &D 5e. Now, for Pathfinder, good God, wh where do we go? Um, there are so many. I would do an Arcanist. An Arcanist is a great general spellcaster. A kineticist. Kineticist, when it comes to the occult and the mental magic, they can control the elements. So absolutely they would be something like that. Um, occultists, why not? Spellcasters that can draw from spirit energy, probably a lot of that on the waters where people have died. Um, summoners, yes. Mesmerists, absolutely. Mesmerists would hypnotize the, the enemy as you board them and, and make them do your will out of just sheer fear or, or, or trickery. Um, illusionists, absolutely. Illusionist, spellcaster, wizard types are great as well as evokers. Um, super things. Transmuters, absolutely. They can transmute the different materials. Um, conjurers, same type of thing as a summoner. You can bring in creatures and work with them. Uh, swashbucklers, heavens forbid, yes, and, and gunslingers, absolutely. Uh, rogue types, there's so many archetypes you can do with the rogues for pirates and for sailors, it's beautiful. Um, bards, scalds, scalds are more of a, a, for those of you not used to them, a combat-oriented uh, bard. So they, they're the Nordic kind of singers that would sing in a battle and inspire. Um, so that, that definitely would be there. Barbarians, absolutely. I would do them in a heartbeat. Fighters, of course. I mean, they they make a lot of sense. Rangers for both campaigns. I'm sorry. Rangers make great navigators as well as uh, people who do the boarding and understanding an area or go to the island. So they could be a good master at arms and, and really smart when it comes to sailing on the seas because they understand the terrain. You can have a sea-based ranger archetype that really understands the terrain. Um... Let's see who else. Investigators, yes, but I would do them more for the sailor side of it. Investigators are okay. Alchemists, love alchemists. They can throw bombs. They can throw different things. They're just nasty. And, and I had a party that went up against one that was just unbelievable fight. Um, let me think what else. 
Uh, samurai, no, I would do that more for the Marines as I would a, a Cavalier or a, a Paladin type. Do them more for the Marines. Uh, knights, kind of the same thing. If you have any Knight Orders, same thing there. Um, Magus, oh, a Magus is, is just wrecking devastation as a captain of a ship or, or as a boarding uh, sergeant at, uh, or, or second mate. Uh, in the case of the pirates, or in the case of the marines, the sergeant of the marines, because they can infuse their weapons with magic, just deadly, deadly, deadly. Which is available? Absolutely, I would do that. That's in both of them. Um, thing through summoners. I'm, I'm just trying not to forget anybody uh, here. Vigilantes, absolutely, especially after pirates, but in some cases after the, the the navies too, because some vigilantes are angry. They have a pirate captain that's a great example in the Shackles who comes from Andoran, the city of freedom, and he was a captain with them in their navy that fought the pirates, but he lost a limb. He lost part of his leg, and they made fun of him and put him in a back position and never let him sail again, so he left and became one of their worst nightmares. He has sank more ch more Taldoran ships than anyone else, single-handedly. So, yeah, they can be quite nasty. And and uh, uh, brawlers love the brawler class. The brawler is perfect because you can switch your fighting styles. So really great for hand-to-hand -hand combat as well as uh, some other things that you can do there. So there's a litany of different classes that I could say you can do. I probably have left some out. I mean, you could do an Inquisitor or Besmara. You could do, uh, and, and by the way, Goddesses for Pathfinder, Besmara, Callistria. Um, Besmara is the, the uh, mother of oceans and piracy. Callistria, revenge and, and prostitution and um, just elves in general. Um, you, Caden Kayleen for a buccaneer type. He is about freeing the slaves, so Caden Kayleen makes a great god out there. Um, Gozra, of course. Gozra, he, she, because he is a he, she, uh, depending on the aspect of what weather it is, uh, is a great seaborne god, uh, goddess that could be used. Um, Bree, maybe for inventions, yes, I could see it. Um, uh, Gorum, absolutely. Gorum is about war and tackling into things and is very chaotic, so absolutely. Um, uh, not Desna, not um, Shellen. I can't really see them unless they're more for the buccaneer type or for the ship type, the, the, the ship marines. Um, for the ship marines, I would go with Irori, and uh, I would also go with Amade. Uh, both of them great for protecting people and, and really, and, and Abadar. Abadar is another one of civilization. Uh, the Red Mantis, absolutely I would use him, but you'd be more assassin-like as a ship captain, but possible. Akashek is really, and that's the name of the Red Mantis god, Akashek, and really nasty, nasty, nasty piece of work. You could do any of the demons, devils, um, pretty much any of the negative evils, absolutely. Uh, but those are the ones that mainly I see in, in the Phrasma also. Phrasma, she is worshipped because she is life and death, and so all societies handle that, even pirates, and they respect Phrasma, the mother of birth and death, very much. And so these are all ones that you could do and use that are really, really good in the campaign. Now, I recommend under professions, and you can do this for both D&D 5 and D&D 3.5 and, and uh, Pathfinder, make people take profession sailor. They need to know how to sail the sea. You can learn it on the fly. It's a real pain in the rear end to do. And if you lose a navigator or somebody dies in your boat, your profession sailor might save you from going under because you can do the task of that person that was lost. Um, navigator, you need knowledge navigation or geography. Uh, you can do a craft skill of map making or a craft skill of shipwright or ship crafter uh, because they can work on the ship and damage. Uh, you can do a profession of a medical profession so having healing and uh, a profession doctor or herbalist would come in real handy on a ship especially in those situations. Um, a weaponsmith, so a, a craft weapons or craft armor would be good. So there's a lot of different things you can do. Hang on real quick.
but keep those in mind. So those are different skill sets that you're going to want to have on the ship. Um, you want to have sea legs. Uh, a lot of the classes have tricks and other things called sea legs, and that just allows you not to take penalty while the ship's moving. That's something you got to take into account, GMs. If they don't have any skill sets that are set for the sea, like profession sailor or anything like that, they are going to get negatives fighting on the deck of a ship. A ship sways. So you're not going to have your best balance. I suggest at least between a negative two to a negative four on their attack and their type of skill checks for dex and strength because they're in a situation they're not used to and the ship is moving it is constantly moving and swaying and especially as it's hit with with munitions or you're trying to board you have to have those skills climbing skill is invaluable swimming skill is inv invaluable survival skill is invaluable on those type of ships uh, acrobatics is invaluable the rest of the stuff maybe maybe not but those things right there are all invaluable skills. So hopefully that helps you a little bit in building your characters um, and what you're going to use. Now common weapons are cutlasses, scimitars, short swords, long swords somewhat, um, boarding axes, hand axes, throwing axes, uh, chakram, uh, uh, desnan pointed, three po five pointed stars, uh, or star knives. There's a lot of different weapons that are suited. Bow and arrow, yeah, kind of. Crossbow is much more so than bow and arrow just because you can set a crossbow and have a better chance of, of not getting negatives, whereas a bow, you're trying to hold it and not, you know, draw and not die <laughs> while you're moving. So it's not impossible, but it's just not the easiest thing to do when your ship is moving. So keep those things in mind when you're building your characters. These are things that you're going to want to have and you're going to want to have some skill sets around them. Knowledge nature, knowledge geography, knowledge engineering. So when you go under and into waters, you know what kind of creatures there are. Um, knowledge local, always invaluable. Knowledge history, yeah, kind of you would need to know that. So, and, and so these are skills you're really going to need in that type of a campaign. Also keep in mind the type of races available. Waterborne races, as long as they can get land legs, will work in these type of campaigns. So you can do a lot of interesting creatures. Jungle-based things are also there. Hang you have to excuse a little of the crying. Mini GM's upset because she hasn't eaten all her lunch, and I have now disciplined her in telling her to sit down and eat. <laughs> so we're going to spit nails at Dee Dee. It's kind of normal. Welcome to fatherhood. Uh, so those kind of things... Also, the location, just really give your players the background of what types of races and where and how they're going to interact and how they look at pirates. That is so important. Like, for instance, in the Pathfinder campaign, the Shackle Islands are real close to the Mwangi Expanse, which is the jungle area. The, it is the Africanized area of that world. So, most of the people you're going to see in the Shackle Isles are cinnamon-skinned, to dark chocolate skinned. That's just the way they are. You're on the equator. Most of them are from that area. Now there's some from the northern continents of Aviston. So there are Chelish there. There are some TNs from the Asian empires around the, the, the bend. There are Kelishites, which are the more Persian people. There are Vudrani. So there are some Vudra that are in that area that are um, uh, the Indian races or the Indian Pakistani style races. There are a lot of halflings because the halflings flee the oppression of being slaves. So there's a big halfling contingent. There are gnomes. Gnomes are ever inquisitive. So gnomes are always suited really well for a pirate campaign. There are some dwarves. The dwarves find professions there. Maybe they were more of an outcast with where they were. So they're a little more combative, a little more skill-based, but they're there. Um, there are half-orcs like No Tomorrow. The half orcs are the kind of the the hated race, so they're there. There are orcs, there are goblins, there are hobgoblins, there are aquatic elves, there are half elves, there are a lot of different other people like tief tieflings or tieflings, however you want to pronounce it. I call it tiefling. I just always like the sound of it that way. But tieflings are there. The the demon races and devil races, half races. The Asimar are also there in some cases. Not as much, but they're there. And um, 
There are also some weird monster races like the Gripply, Boggards, and Lizard Men. You will find them there. The Serpent People are there. Uh, so there's a lot of different things. There's also wares and some unique wares in the, in the Shackle Islands. There's a captain that's a werewolf, a free captain. He has a crew that's a mix of all kinds of wares, including were sharks. So, yeah, they have were sharks and were crocodiles, too. So, guess what? <laughs> you never know what you might run out to in the Shackle Isles. There are the undead, the draugr. The draugr, the dreaded draugr, are there in those areas. Um, there are other undead that are there. There's uh, dragons that are out in that area. So, you know, if you were converting it to 5e, there can be dragon kin that would be in that area or dragon kind. So there are a lot of different races you can really bring in, and, and it makes sense to be there in those areas. Uh, Strix are another one. Strix are kind of the bird people that are out of the Chelish Empire, and they're an interesting character to have on that type of ship. So a Strix would be really, really interesting to run. Damn fear, maybe the half vampires could be there. They're just not as more common. Cat folk, absolutely. You're in the jungle area. Cat folks are common. Rat folk, absolutely. They're a hardy race. They can easily survive out on a ship. Um, the either the uh, Tengu, which is in some of the guides, the Tengu are the the bird race and ours. But there's also, I forget the name of the, the crow folk that are in the D&D &D side, but they're, they're close to the Tengu. Um, so the two of them are both there. They're kind of an outcast race, so there are definitely a lot of pirates that are made out of those. Um, just trying to think of other races. There are so many things you could run as a pirate. Merfolk, Gilmen. Um, Gilmen, what were the Aslanti people, but they evolved to be a waterborne water guild race when their island sank. So all those are there and especially the landmark wise in the in the um, the Shackle Isles of Pathfinder there's a thing called the Eye of Abendigo and the eye was formed upon Earthfall when the supposedly quick snapshot of the history the Aboleth called the Veiled Masters controlled civilization, and when the Islanti got too rebellious and full of themselves that they could do it without them, they brought down a star stone, a very large meteor, into the world, and it destroyed and sent the world into an age of darkness. And so it just messed everything up. So from that, the Islanti Empire was one of the areas that was sunken by it. And so the Aslant had to evolve or die, and they did. And some went to Taldor, what is today modern-day Taldor, and some became Gilman. And that's, there are no more pure bloods from what they say, at least. Um, so there's a lot of places you can really base your characters from, but make sure your players know. See, as you can see, I've, I've got some things in my mind of what's what. Also, really have a good plot. It's not just about go take this ship, go take that ship. It's a building. So, for instance... With my campaigns, the free captaincy, if you want to be a pirate or a privateer, being a free captain is your license to be that on the world and with the Shackles Island Isles, where the, where the pirates are really thick as thieves. If you don't fly a, a known uh, free captain flag, they have every right to sink your ship, the free captain captains, because you're not one of the Brotherhood, and so you're an invader, you're an outcast, and they will come after you. So keep that in mind, that that's probably true in a lot of places, both on Greyhawk and on Faerun as well. You can also have Air Captain Pirates there, and you can have them here too. On my world, on the world of the Inner Sea, there is Alkenstar, and Alkenstar has airships. Go figure. Firearms and airships. Hmm. So there's a lot of rich history. That's why I like running things there, but make sure your players know it. So with that, I, I just wanted to give you guys a little snapshot into it as you write your characters up. Really think about backstories. Why did they become a pirate? What drove them there? Did they grow up with it? Were they chased there? Were they former Navy and just kicked out? What drove them to what they're doing now? And what are their goals and ambitions? And really write that campaign around it because I think you can have a lot of fun with this. There's a lot of aids you can use. Uh, you can use the Shackle Isles from Pathfinder as one of your aids. Uh, the uh, Freeport 
family of guides. So the free city of Freeport, that's in Green Ronin. They've got tons of books on that that you can do for either 5e, 4e, or Pathfinder. So they have it for all the above. Seventh uh, C is another guide that's really good. Um, there's some other ones that were done as well. So there's a lot of different material that's out there. Really utilize that material. Um, for the jungle area of Pathfinder, it's the Mwangi, so it's the heart of the jungle. That's a great little aid that gives you ideas. And, and there's things that you have to take into account. Diseases. Um, uh, of course, uh, Lyme disease out on the ship because you're not eating enough fruits and things that you need to do. Um, seasickness. Uh, starvation. Drinking of salt water. So dehydration. There's so many different things that you play into when you're working with these type of things. Just keep those things in mind. Thanks and have a great uh, day. And if you got any questions, hit me up uh, at my GM tip site.